Hi, I've been told I have to do an intro to this section and I have no choice. So here's the intro and here's George who I'm going to chat to. Hello. Hi, George. Why, why, why are you at um, Occupy? Because we might as well try and not, not <laughs> destroy life as we know it and it, we could even make it we better, could. you know, <laughs> it's, it's my view. Might as well try. And we do have a sort of perfect storm of, of crapness that seems to demand some kind of systemic response. Yeah. Yeah. And empty buildings like this wonderful one to, to come and try and exactly. get on with it. With central heating. Yeah. In Amazing. Kind of I've been in a tent personally for the last five weeks, so this is this is quite luxurious to have walls and roofs and heating. Pretty good. So, any are there any specific uh, reasons why you are protesting? Because unless we do, it doesn't change, basically. You but know, anything, what, what exactly do you want change to change? Oh, well, I'll go into that. But what I was going to say is that democracy as it should be, right, would be politicians go out to the street and find out what people want. And, you know, as long as it doesn't go against basic principles of justice and fairness, then they'd go about trying to put that into practice. Very powerfully. Can we make interest what to do? And us saying that we want things to change, like we want an equal world and we want to not destroy the world and stuff like that. If we want to actually turn that into policy, we have to work very hard to fight against the incredibly powerful vested economic interests in the mm. system. And, and, and we can't engage in the, the normal, so-called normal democratic, so-called democratic process because you can vote, you have no choice about voting and you can vote for a party who then doesn't uh, follow the pre-election pledges. And we have no example, means whatsoever to yeah. get them to do that. Yeah. For example, I voted for the Liberal Democrats because I wanted tuition fees to be Sorry. abolished. It's <laughs> right, it's right. I know, it's tragic. And people people, people and, uh, have tuition their own fees have been raised. That's right. That's a personal issue. Yeah. Um, um, but I mean, I think things like, you know, in, in the States, people's disillusionment with Obama, for instance, is a major part of the energy behind Occupy, disillusionment of people voted Lib Dem for the whole coalition government, yeah. this might actually change the political game, and sure enough, it didn't. Um, and what's special about these things is that they get into the informational space and the public space and the psychological space. And you know, one of the really cool things I heard the other day was that um, Google searches for things like inequality and Corporation mm -hmm. of London and stuff have gone up about 300% since the occupation started five weeks ago. Um, yeah, so if anyone says, oh, why are they here? What's the point? You know, like, mm -hmm. To get people having a conversation about things that we need to do and things that need to change. It's really interesting the way that there's loads of uh, newspaper articles going. Pete, there's they're no point doing this thing. It hasn't changed anything. What's changed? Nothing. And then they go on within that article to discuss economic in inequality, and you're like, yeah, the, but lots of like what the protest has resulted in is huge. Like throughout every any major newspaper you pick up on any day, this protest is being discussed. And then the kind of issues of, well, what are they talking about? Oh, they're not talking about anything. Oh, but it's something to do with in economic inequality. And then the kind of commentator will go on to discuss, like, e e economic inequality. Sure, sure, sure. And, and that uh, makes the point as yeah. to why we're here. No, no, definitely. And, you know, obviously one of the reasons we're here is that the media is generally a crock of shit. Um, am I allowed to swear? Sorry. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, I mean, paid for at ninety percent by by corporate advertising, owned by increasingly concentrated corporate behemoths that obviously have the interest of people like them at heart, um, and the fact that this has to be a slow, patient, gradual process of having conversations that find ways to go round those, you know, those obstacles that are put in front of us by the media, in the form of all these kind of diversions about the. The closing the church and the tent, the health and safety, you know, all these things that they'll use to try and talk about um, the messenger and not the message, those things are bound to happen, they're totally predictable and the fact that we're hopefully building a movement that is about having that kind of patience and determination and creativity to work around those things um, gives us a chance of actually getting to the point where we get enough people realising that we can actually fight for the things that we all say already that we agree on, you know. And because this system is so in incredibly much about concentrating benefits in very, very few hands from a democratic point of view, and in a country like the UK, we do still have, t you know, formally a democracy. Um, there is a huge amount of there's huge possibility in terms of actually changing the political dialogue and, and getting people um, into a kind of unified, inspired constituency of people who actually have faced. Oh, people who are facing the real problems that we actually have. 
you know, in terms of climate change, in terms of massive social inequality and all that comes with it, in terms of this global assault on, on um, public services. This is so much from the same playbook that has been going through country after country in the developing world for the last 30 years. The only difference in the last few years is that what, what's been happening here um, is happening in rich countries, which before was thought unthinkable, you know. And you look at a very interesting thing, Italy now is paying what, 7 percent on its government bonds and everyone's going, oh, this, this is impossible, this can't be done, no government should have to pay 7 percent on the government bonds. Poor countries have been paying 40 percent, you know, for years and years and we don't give a shit. You know, so the fact that this system, this incredibly predatory system that destroys real economies is coming home to roost in the countries that, that spawned it. I think does give us a real hope that we can do something about getting people together across the world to actually stand up to the, the global economy, which after all is just a system of power governed by certain rules and regulations designed by the lobbying of the powerful across the world. So, you know, that system can be changed. There's no reason why it can't. It's not some supernatural entity that, that needs to be appeased. Um, it's a set of rules that we can do something about. So that was a bit of a rant. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what is, what's the issue? You've been on, on the Corporation of London Working Group. Yes. And so uh, what's been the kind of most recent decision or thoughts around uh, that? I've actually more recently been working on the Corporation's Working Group. This, by the way, I'm Can sitting in the Bank of Ideas at the moment. Um, and I've mainly been in St Paul's the last five weeks, so the working groups I'm part of have been more affiliated to St Paul's than the Bank of Ideas. But yes, I have been in the Corporation of London Working Group, that's one working group. And I've also been in the Corporations Working Group generally. So one is dealing with this particularly weird, arcane institution that is the Corporation of London. That It's the, the kind of structure that houses the biggest tax haven in the world. Um, that facilitates all sorts of developing world corruption, that it essentially sort of sucks up the real economy at you know, increasing speed. Um, it's this very secretive organisation, not just financially, but otherwise. Like, um, I mean, it's, it, it's been quite interesting finding out about, about that place, because a lot of, they've always tried to give the impression I think they're just another kind of local borough, but in fact that, that institution um, is very bizarre democratically, it doesn't come under normal democratic control. Um, one of the things that came out in the, the work that people have been doing is that um, there's this figure called the Remembrancer who sits behind mm. the, the Speaker of the House of Commons mm. that represents at all times the interests of, of um, you know, the city and um, concentrated financial interests. Um, and these are things that most people hadn't, had no idea about. And interestingly, like three I mean, people who were alive 50, 60 years ago when Clement Attlee in the early 50s was trying to do something at the Corporation of London might remember this, but three governments have tried to do something about this incredibly powerful institution that undermines democracy so fundamentally, and all of them have failed thus far because of its financial might. But I think the, the fact that it is damaging so many people in so many ways and threatening the very existence of the species on the planet pretty much, i.e. I, not the corporation itself, but the kind of undemocratic financial hegemony that facilitates that that aligns necessity with you know positive values about of change you know we actually have to turn around this system pretty damn quickly otherwise we're screwed and also it would be really nice in terms of making society better and you know vaguely equal and democratic but so hopefully that confluence that converging the the converging crises can be enough to stimulate people to fight sufficiently against them because things are really bad in the world at the moment. You've got this sort of veering to the right in so many places, so we need to take very seriously the need to get together and do something about it. Compassionate revolution. But um, but yes, I'm talking way too much. To <laughs> <laughs> what what has brought you to the bank of ideas? No. Um, I think it's generally a sense of I think there's a really useful. Spanish group they call it, I always forget the name, Indignacios? Indignados. I, indignados, mm -hmm. which is a really good word, and I just think it's a sort of sense of outrage and indignation about uh, the incredible inequalities and widening wealth gaps that have happened in our society, which was, I mean, I'm a youth and community worker, so I work with young people from marginalised and you know backgrounds and uh, I just see how their lives and their futures have been sort of I mean just 
destroyed is a strong word, but so much has changed over the last, just with, even with the year. Seven, in Hackney, 70% of youth centres are closed. The educational maintenance allowance, which keeps people at college, has been cut. The university fees are now out of people's price range or even conceptual range. And youth unemployment has massively increased. And at the same time, the fact that directors' salaries increased by 42 I don't know, there's some huge 40, number... It's 14, 49% this, in the yeah, last year. In the last year. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, but like, you know, people, direct, you know, people at the very highest level of the banking institutions are, seem to be making, doing even better out of the economic mm. crisis and out of the cuts and out of the kind of, you know, the, the way that our society is interested in is in retracting the assets and the, you know, of the rich. And uh, at the same time, there's like sort of a complete laissez-faire attitude towards... You know, the bottom quite large percentage of our society who are on the on the poverty line. One in three children are brought up in poverty in the UK, and one of the richest world's richest countries. And uh, I just find that 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 just fills me with a sense of outrage and indignation. And uh, I just think enough's enough. I've got to stop. Okay. I've got to like reset people's way of thinking about the world because everyone seems to think this is kind of normal and it's okay. And, you know, be slight, like, mm, well, this, should this be happening in the newspapers? But people just don't seem to think they can stop it. They don't think they can do anything. They're like, oh, what can you do? And, you know, I think that's got to change. We, we have the power to change our society, and we've got, we've got the truth. We've got to do it. And I think, you know, that, that points to the sense in which this isn't just a political movement. It is, for want of a better word, a, a spiritual movement, a compassionate movement. It's about recognising the need to kind of see ourselves outside this framing of kind of individual consumer status which cuts down our sense of possibility so much and I think it's also about understanding the very concrete um, informational powers that increasingly make people see themselves a certain way which is incredibly disempowering. I'd highly recommend anyone who hasn't read it, um, George Monbiot's recent article which is called um, Sucking Out Our Brains Through Our Eyes and it started <laughs> out with it, it started with a sentence, pretty courageous I mean, um, it started with a sentence kind of the something like the advertising that is paid paid for and borders this very article is destroying life as we know it or something and it just goes in, in in very sort of clear terms into the way that system attacks us on every level. You know, it, it turns us into what they call kind of extrinsic individuals, i.e. people that are just mm. increasingly concerned with things outside ourselves that really have very little to do with our true happiness that make us But nothing want to do with your true happiness because no, like, as, you know, lots of research has shown that like once you're above a certain like minimum standard, having more possessions doesn't make you more happy. Mm -mm -mm. And so Absolutely. it's just completely unrelated. All the wealth in our country has got unrelated to happiness. Interestingly, even in, like, in China, the, the massive increase in... <laughs> Do you want us to start soon? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, in China, interestingly, the, the happiness levels of people who've gone from having really, really very little to quite a lot more, i.e. that have very much been in that category that mm. it was thought before, you know, at least that those kind of increases do actually make people happy because it's been done in such a sort of rampant, consumerist way that sort of undermines stability and sense of place and community and, you know, security for the future so much that actually that happy, that extra wealth has actually has created unhappiness amongst that, that vast group that is, you know, celebrated as the, you know, the group that has risen the fastest out of poverty in all time, uh, of all time. Um, and so that even though, even the kind of wealth that we're creating at the moment doesn't seem to be making people happy, even at, at the very relatively low level of, of um, increased material wealth. But, um, but yeah, it's insanity, you know. Yeah. Cool. Now we've been told we have to do an outro, and so that's a rule and a law, and that we tried to resist that idea. We were told that that was not acceptable, and we had no, we had no participation and no decision making in this process. So.